Give him all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. He wears the victor's crown. He has overcome so that we are more than overcomers. Thank you, Father God, that the battle is yours and the victory is ours. And you receive all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. We are so grateful for the finished work of the cross. We are so grateful for the resurrection power on the inside of each and every one of us. We are so grateful for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you continue to do. We are truly grateful and thankful. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for the men and the women that you've placed in our lives to walk alongside us. Thank you for this wonderful spiritual family. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to walk in the light as you are the light. Thank you, Father God, for loving us and correcting us and leading us and guiding us. Thank you for instructing us. Thank you for warning us. Thank you, Father God. And all those uh, who are grateful and thankful, give him an amen. Give him a hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated in heavenly places. I want to greet our um, online family watching tonight as we are celebrating Passover. Um, last night I touched on the whole thing about um, Passover with the Gregorian calendar and the Jewish calendar. We got all of that out of the way. So we celebrate the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ every day. Because that's the foundation of Christianity. It's through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ that we are Christians. That's why we are disciples of His. Because of what he went through, what he did, and what he accomplished so that we are able to overcome. Amen? That's the good news of the gospel. But when we were worship, praising in the first song, what stood out was, ask the man that fell on the bones of Elisha. Now, I, I'm very picture-orientated you know, picture oriented images, and I pictured myself that I was that man. Can you imagine you were, I don't know, whether you were sick for a long time or if you died suddenly, we don't know. But all of a sudden, they're getting, his funeral's being raided. And his family throws him on the bones of a dead prophet. And to imagine you were dead and you just suddenly wake up <laughs> on bones. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, that, that will change your thinking. It's like, how did I get you? Where was I? <laughs> that you fall on dead bones. <laughs> all you remember was you were in the Jerusalem hospital and they had all these tubes in you, like next minute on both. Like, woo! <laughs> Praise God for Jerusalem private hospitals. <laughs> you don't know. But anyway, that's how I see things, so please forgive me. But the reality of you were dead, now you are alive because of a dead man who had so much anointing in him. That you who were dead, there was no faith involved. There's no faith in the prophet's bones. There was no faith in the dead man. But it's the power of resurrection. That is the power that we have. That power to be set free, to be delivered, and to remain free. Amen? So tonight we continue about Jesus was in control. So I need you to please be patient with me. Because there's a lot of scripture. And, and I am getting better. I have been getting through most of this stuff. But I'm going to try my best and then we're going to have communion. Amen. So um, depending on how long I minister for, we'll see if that grape juice turns into proper wine. <laughs> you know, just depending on how, how long the message goes on. But praise God. So if you get a bit tipsy afterwards, it's not my fault. <laughs> okay. So Jesus was in control. I know some of us, when we hear the story about Jesus' crucifixion, it's a horrible story where... Somebody who is so innocent, who is so pure, so holy, got punished and he did nothing wrong. And yet he took our sin, our shame and all of that upon himself. He took our sicknesses, his, our diseases. He was wealthy, he was rich and he became poor so that we can become rich. So he did everything for us. But let's quickly look that Jesus was in control of everything. So Matthew 21 verse 2 to 7, and this is, speaks about when Jesus tells the disciples about the cult, okay? So this would be basically when you do Palm Sunday, you know, when Jesus was going into Jerusalem. So verse 2 says, saying to them, 
Go into the village opposite to you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Okay? Pay attention to the details, because I'm going to show you something that's going to blow your mind, because you must read your Bible, okay? And it says, loose them and bring them to me. Verse 3, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. Can you imagine? Total strangers come and they take your, your donkey and the colt. Hey? And if, if, <laughs> if this was in the West, they would have become guns blazing. But here he gives the instruction, just tell them the Lord is in need of it. Can you imagine coming to take your donkey and colt? But all you need to say is the Lord is in need of it. Lord who? Eh? This shows you Jesus was in control. Okay, The Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. Verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, verse 5, Till the daughter of Zion, behold your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey. You notice he says lowly, not like Saul, not like David, where everything was luxury. Yeah, he's coming on a donkey. Okay, I understand in those days, that was the, 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 the transport. And depending on the type of donkey, you know, that was a good purchase and, and things like that. But right now, we're looking at this and we're seeing that Jesus was coming with a humble heart. Okay? He's presenting himself as a humble servant. Okay? And sitting on a donkey, a colt, the, f the fall of a donkey. Verse 6. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. Can you imagine an animal that has never been ridden that Jesus just sat on? And he didn't have a rodeo. Because I can tell you right now, donkeys are stubborn. You can't just ride them how you want to. Showing you that Jesus had control. We didn't see he was you know, having the rodeo there. He just climbed on a donkey and the donkey responded. See, this is the God that we serve. Amen? But now we, I want you to pay attention about the donkey and the colt. Because we're going to see... Jacob. Jacob is on his deathbed. And, and we did this in Bible study a couple of, I think it was two years ago. And I did an in-depth teaching on the prophecy of Jacob. So uh, I think Jeanette, you were there. I think you guys were there. We'll see if it comes back, it comes back. Verse 9 says, Judah is a lion whelp from the prey, my son. You have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him. Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Which tribe did Jesus come from? Okay, you guys know your Bible. So this is Jacob prophesying over his son Judah, saying that the scepter of a king will not depart from that tribe. Okay? You need to understand Jacob is dying and he's prophesying. Watch what he's going to say next. Okay. Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Sheol comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Verse 11. Now listen to this. Binding his donkey to the vine. Who is the vine in John chapter 15? Jesus. Donkey being tied to the vine, okay? And his donkey's colt. Here is a man dying. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is already prophesying the Messiah. Yeah. I know I sound you like, yo. I know it takes time to, to, to take this in because it was prophesied from the lips of a man that was in covenant with God on his deathbed. Look at that. God puts every detail in there so that when we read it and by the Holy Spirit revealing it to us, because you can't see this if you don't have the Holy Spirit. You understand? It's the Holy Spirit that brings life and you're like, wow, it's been there this whole time. Okay? Binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey called to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine. Okay? And his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's why we're going to be doing communion tonight. Okay? 
All right? Because that is a sign. You see, a man that is dying, he sees somebody that is covered in blood. But the only way he can describe it is grapes that's been crushed. The blood of grapes. Okay? And he says here, garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Verse 12, his eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. All right, that, that is a man dying, prophesying over his son. Can you imagine receiving a prophecy and it doesn't make sense right now? What does it have to do with vine and, 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 and wine? And what does it have to do with grapes and donkeys and colts? Because <laughs> Judah never saw it in his lifetime. The only time he gets to see it is from the grandstands, if he made it. That he gets to see, this is exactly what my father prophesied over my life. Look at what Jesus is doing. <laughs> Amen. This is why some of us, we will be so surprised and <laughs> overwhelmed when we begin to see the words that were prophesied over us come to fruition. Either in our children's lives or their grandchildren's or the great-grandchildren. Because some of the prophetic words that God has given us is too big for us to fulfill in this lifetime. That is why there's a prophecy that continues to go from generation to generation to generation. That is why it's so important to run your race and not abandon your post. Keep on running no matter how difficult it gets because at the end of the day, your offsprings, they have a destiny to fulfill. Amen? So let's go to Luke chapter 22, verse 10 to 13. Verse 10 says, And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitch of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Now look at this. Jesus is not phoning to make a reservation. He's telling his people, go to this place, to this city. You'll find this man carrying this, that, and the other. And you go and you speak. This is how Jesus is operating. This is prophetic on another level. Okay, I know some of you are going to get it later. I promise you. Watch. A pitcher of water, follow him into the house which he enters. Verse 11. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, this is not even Jesus speaking. He's speaking through somebody. This is why when you are being used of God, the words that you speak, which is downloaded from the word and from the spirit, is directly from God. Mm. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I am um, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. Verse 12. Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. Then <laughs> make ready. Verse 13. So they went and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. See, scholars would try and say, no, no, no. Jesus already made pre-plans prior. But here we see Jesus is giving them clear um, instructions saying, you got to meet a man, this is what he's going to be uh, carrying, and then you follow him, and then you tell him, where's the room so I may have the Passover. There was no speaking, because they, you see, <laughs> like we have the opportunity when you phone a restaurant, I would like to have a, a reservation for uh, 12, uh, make it 13, and uh, we're going to need it for 5 p.m. That's how we make reservations. But yeah, Jesus is Saying, listen, I'm in control of the Passover. Okay? Let's go to verses 20 to 23 in Luke chapter 22. 20 says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. You know, some people... You got somebody in the church that just gifted you the one day because the sun was in their eyes, and you think that they hate you now. But here is Jesus sitting at a table eating with his betrayer, and he knows it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Look here, yeah. verse 22. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Verse 23. Then they began to question among themselves, which of them it was who would do this thing? Who, who is it? You know, sitting around the table, who is the one that's about to betray Jesus? You know, many of us, listen, 
A time of persecution is going to come. And we are going to be given a choice to live or to die. If you renounce Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you shall live. But if you do not renounce him, you shall die. People, there are people going around the world that are losing their lives because of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yeah, we have it easy. Ah, if I go to church next week, it's okay. It's all right. I will I'll see Jesus on my time. There are people giving up families. They are giving up their uh, heritage. They're giving up their lives to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. When you go to China, there's underground churches. If they get caught... They will all die. I, 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 I'm going to just share a quick testimony. There was a gentleman who used to preach in China. And I went to listen to his message. And he said, because the Chinese people are superstitious, how they moved him from one building to the next, they stuck him in a coffin. So the, the Chinese people are superstitious, so they don't want to touch or look inside the coffin. And this preacher was transported from house to house, places where Christians were hiding, and he was hidden in a coffin with Bibles. <laughs> That is, now can you imagine being that itinerant minister? Hey, where am I going to preach? Just stick me in a coffin and send me. You down on the oxygen, that coffin could be lit on fire. That could be your last message. They could throw you into the, I don't know. But you just, just like, please, Lord Jesus. That man must have been in faith. Amen. Going from one place to the next in a coffin. That man was really dead to the flesh. <laughs> Think about it. Everybody wants, oh, no, no, if you invite me, I want a nice big king-size bed. It has to be so thick and this, da, 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 da. I can only stay in a five-star hotel. You know, uh, I need certain meals, certain water that needs to be imported all the way from Jerusalem. There are men that are preaching like that. Okay, let me not go there. Let's get back to this Bible. I just want to, I don't know, I just opened up something there. John 13, verse 26 30 because I'm going to show you how Jesus was in control 26 says Jesus answered it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it and having dipped the bread he gave it to Judas Iscariot the son of Simon verse 27 now after the piece of bread Satan entered him see Jesus gave the bread and as the bread was given Satan entered. This is why we are warned when we take communion. Do not take communion unworthily. That's why you repent before. Okay, I'm just sharing something here because this was what they're doing. Okay, All right, We don't just take communion because it's biscuits and, 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 and juice. There is deep meaning to what is happening here. Because I remember one Sunday I made a, 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 a altar call and I said... Do not take this communion unless you are serious with Jesus. And there were two people that didn't take it and they were backslidden. Okay? Because they did not want to make that decision. Jesus Christ is my Lord. That's what we're going to be doing tonight. By you partaking of communion, you are saying that you are my Lord and you are my Savior. You are my Alpha and you are my Omega, you are my beginning and you are my end. You are my everything. That is what we're doing tonight. Okay? So make sure that you make right tonight. Amen? Hallelujah. I've got a very quiet day in this Presbyterian church now. So we're serious about Jesus. Jesus is serious about us. He paid with his life because he takes us that serious. Okay? Verse 26, Jesus answered. Uh, wait, I apologize. Sorry. Going back to... Um, 27, yeah, you're right. Thank you very much. 26, Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it and have dipped the bread. He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Verse 27, Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. He did not speak to Judas. He spoke to Satan. Go and do what you need to do quickly. Now, don't come and tell me Jesus had no clue what was going on. He is basically orchestrating his crucifixion. The one who wants to kill him, he's the one giving him the order to go do what he needs to do. And Jesus is so shrewd and so wise in what he's doing. Satan is thinking, I got you now. 
Meanwhile, <laughs> Satan is getting told what he needs to do in order for you and I to be saved. Satan thought he had all of us because we were all deceived. We were all lied to. And Satan's thinking, if I kill the Messiah, I kill this man who has all these miracles. All these other demons say he is the Messiah. He must be the son of God. And I'm going to kill him. And Jesus says, go do what you need to go do. Can you imagine looking at Satan and telling him, because Jesus saw Satan eyeball to eyeball. Remember when he got filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of you, you wonder why when you come and get filled with the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden you come out of attack. <laughs> hey, it's because now you're going to see your adversary, but you're going to give him a paxla because the Holy Ghost is on the inside of you. All you need to do is know this. Amen? So let's continue. Hmm. Verse 28. But no one at the table knew for what reason he had said this to him. 29. For some thought, because Judas had the money box. Okay, Jesus is the only person that can afford to have a thief in his ministry. That Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. See, everybody that was around was so naive. They're like, oh, Judas is about to go give to charity and things. Not knowing that Jesus has instructed his um, enemy to go and do what he needs to do. Okay? They're thinking, wow, Jesus is so good. Judas is such a righteous man. Meanwhile, he's robbing you blind. <laughs> okay? These people didn't have the Holy Spirit, not discernment. Verse 30. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Okay? Let's look, uh, let's look at Luke 22, verse 1 to 6. Are you seeing how Jesus is in control? Nothing took Jesus by surprise. Okay? Verse 1 says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. This is why you'll notice there's certain feasts, there's seven uh, Jewish feasts, and some of them actually... Um, like they overlap each other. So that's why we just class it as Passover. Unleavened bread speaks about removing sin, checking yourself to make sure, sure there's no sin in you. That's why the Jews don't eat bread with yeast in it because yeast represents sin. So you don't want anything to ferment, okay, which will represent sin. So now the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, drew near, which is called Passover, verse 2. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him. For they feared the people. Verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So we see because Judas had an open door, and if you go read your Bible, it speaks about he was helping himself. He was, bless myself, five finger, you know, ministry, help yourself, bless myself, because charity starts at home. That's Judas. You heard those things, eh? Because that's what he was doing. Charity starts at home. Okay? Then Satan entered Judas, all right? Let's go to verse 4. So he went his way and uh, conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. So he was negotiating, what am I going to do to betray? Can you imagine you've been walking with this man for three years. You saw eyes open. You saw blind eyes see. Uh, you saw the lame walk. You saw people that were filled with leprosy. They flesh was falling off and he cleansed them and then you see a uh, bread multiplied fish multiplied he saw these things then peter goes and finds a fish and there's a gold coin judas must have been very interested to find out which pool that they went fishing because they, i'm sure judas went fishing after that <laughs> okay because this man was money 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 okay and it was strange that it was only Peter because he, him and Jesus were the oldest out of all the disciples. Please understand this. The disciples were young men. Not what you see in some of the Bibles and pictures that you get. They were old men. They were young boys because Jesus and Peter were the only ones that paid the tax at the temple because you had to be 30 years old to pay tax in the temple. Just read your Bible. It's amazing. Okay. Let's continue. Um, verse 5. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. Can you imagine you sold the Messiah for money? You sold the miracles, the one who did miracles, the one who healed, the one they blessed, the one that was so good to people. You sold him for money. 
Same thing that happened to Joseph, verse 6. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So they wanted to separate Jesus because the people saw him as a prophet. They saw the mighty works. The people even, they were afraid to talk about Jesus because they might have been excommunicated from the temple. You know, today you can't talk in certain denominations about the Holy Spirit because the bishop's not there. Listen, the Bible is the Bible. If you believe in the Bible, preach the Bible. should be that way. Mm. Amen. Let's continue. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 34. I know I'm jumping around in the book of Luke chapter 22. There is so much life in this chapter. But I want to show you that these little snippets that Jesus was in control. All right. 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you. Now you see, Judas had an open door and here is Peter and he's being confronted with Satan. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now look at how Jesus responds. You know many times I'm telling you that in Ephesians chapter 2, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for you and I. This is what he's interceding for you and I. Look at this. Satan, I rebuke you. No, he doesn't say that. Look here. Verse, verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Jesus is not saying, I rebuke you, Satan. You will not touch my son. You will not touch my daughter. No. He's saying, I know the faith that is in their heart. And I'm praying that their faith will not fail them. This is why it is not about your money. It's not about your health. It's not about your identity. It's about your faith. He's attacking you in your faith area. But he comes in different ways and strategies. So it looks like he's attacking your finances. Looks like he's attacking your identity because he wants to get to the core of who you are. That is faith. Because you see in the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 3 it says, For God has given every man a measure of faith. Everybody's got faith in them. But it's through the word of God that brings enlightenment to what faith you have and which direction and where you apply your faith. Because you can have misplaced faith. People have put their faith in their boss. People have put faith in their spouse. People have put faith in their government. But it's misplaced. When you put your faith in Jesus, doesn't matter who is in authority. doesn't matter who your boss is. doesn't matter who you're married to. Because at the end of the day, he is your source. He is your provider. He is your protector. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. He will save that wayward child. He will save that wayward spouse. As long as your faith does not fail. And what does that mean? That means you've got to walk like a Christian walks. It means you've got to talk like a Christian talks. You cannot behave like the world and expect them to want to have what you have, which is religion. But if you have a relationship with Jesus, they will see what you have. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Uh, let's continue. Verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Jesus is already prophesying when Peter is about to betray him, okay, or deny him, sorry, he denies him three times. And then Jesus is standing at the, uh, uh, um, on the shore and he's busy brying fish while they're fishing. And this is where he's starting to prophesy that when the time comes that you will strengthen your brethren. Because the time's going to come when the Lord is going to strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Because that's exactly what happened. As soon as Christ had been struck, when God had released that timing of crucifixion, the faithful, the ones that said, I will die for you, they were the first ones to. <laughs> how many of you have had those friends? They're sitting and they're telling you how much they love you. Hey, my brother, I will die for you. It's because he's got drink in him and he says he's going to do something. But as soon as he loses his courage, because that's what the, the reason they speak like is the only time in courage, they, they got courage, is that liquid, liquid courage. And then when they come to themselves, they realize, yo, you in this for yourself, my friend. That's it. <laughs> they don't even know you anymore. But listen, okay? Jesus, he's there closer to you than a brother. He's closer to you than the very breath that you breathe. You think it's oxygen that is keeping you alive. <laughs> he is keeping you alive. Not one of you told your, your heart, pump. If you've got a pacemaker, yes, the pacemaker will only go off when the heart stops. But the heart is still pumping 
Who is it? Jesus. You think you tell him hardly. Blink, breathe, inhale. Can you imagine just trying to function for 10 minutes, thinking, blinking, oh, breathe. You'll be, <laughs> you'll collapse. It's so exhausting. Think about it. Inhale. <sighs> Exhale. <sighs> Don't look too obvious. <laughs> hey? Yeah, it's the truth. And it's done automatically. Okay, let's continue. Um, look here, verse uh, 33. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Wow. You know, it's amazing. It's words. It's easy to speak. But actions are another story. I, I will die for my faith. My friend, you don't even live for your faith. I will go to prison. You don't even go to church for your faith. What do you mean you will go to prison? Sorry, did I say that out loud? I was just thinking a bit loud there. Because that's what people say. Hey. I will go to prison for my faith. You don't even go to church for your faith. What are you talking about? 34. Then he said, is it too hard tonight? I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Verse 34. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall crow this day. It's not tomorrow, this day. You will deny me, not once, twice, three times, that you don't know me. There is a man that confessed you looked at your messiah i'm saying to you my brother whatever you go through i'm gonna go to prison i'll die for you then you look at me like (laughs) as the rooster crows (laughs) you will deny that you even know me can you imagine what peter must have been going through i think the blood just like what are you talking about i'll die for you me you and me we're this close you know we're this close you know we like that's you that's me It's the truth. People say they're close. They're not close. Yeah. Okay. Look here. This is now speaking about the time of his betrayal. Let's go to John 18, verse 2 to 9. 2 says, And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. He was going to betray him in a place that is familiar. Some place that you share with them, an intimate moment of being with God. That's the worst place you could imagine. Us, it will be in our home. Okay? They betray you in your own home. Here is a place where Jesus and the disciples meet. And Judas is thinking we're going to fix him there. He's not going to expect this. Because if you look at it, Jesus is not going to be on guard. Because that's normally what happens. When you're at home, you're not guarded. It's your home. You're relaxed. You're not going to be thinking anything bad. So that's the best place because he's going to be chilled. It's in his domain. He is relaxing. But Judas did not know that somebody already knew. (laughs) He knows all things. Amen. Verse 3. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Can you imagine an entire group of soldiers coming to fetch one man who doesn't even have a sword? Okay. And, he, and, he, and he's, he's defenseless. But an entire group of soldiers who are armed for war to come and get hold of one person. Okay? Mm. Verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things. See, once again, he knows all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? This is my favorite part. Verse 5. Then they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Verse 6. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Boom. Can you imagine the peop- the person you come in to arrest just says, I am he. <laughs> Under the power. Now, listen, I... I I love when the power of God touches people. I love when the power of God touches me. I, I, I'm addicted to it because I know when he touches me, I'm encountering the touch of God. God is about to download. He's got to reveal something. He's got to impart something. So I can imagine. I, In a sense, these men were not going for impartation. They were not coming up for prayer for somebody to stand in agreement. These people came to arrest him and he said, I am he. You, you stand up there like, what happened? <laughs> what happened? Who hit me? 
Think about it, because that's what it sometimes feels like when somebody lays hands on you and you fall under the powers. Like, what, what happened? <laughs> I had a couple of those. I remember I was in the south of Johannesburg. Prophet Kenneth had all of his little kiddies on a Saturday. They are ranging from uh, three years to six years old. And he says, would you like them to pray for you? I said, yes. And these kids laid hands on me. Man, I've never felt the power of God hit me that hard. That I was rolling, I had carpet burn, and I still had to preach after that. I'm not lying, I had carpet burn, I was rolling, the power of God hit me. And then all the other dignitary p- p- pastors were watching me rolling on the floor. It's like, what's going on with this guy? God touched me. And that night when I preached on the fire of God, man, I think Philippe was there. I started screaming, I said, listen, he is here. The fear of God hit me. I was trying to hide behind the pulpit. Because I said, he's here. Father, forgive us. <laughs> don't kill us. That is what was happening. Amen? Uh, I don't know. You guys, uh, that's what I want. I want him to come into this building. That you know Jesus was here. That you are too afraid <laughs> to do anything. You will make sure you look left and right and left and right again. Just to make sure before you cross the road. Because when you encounter God in that magnitude, you know that He is alive. Because when He touches you, <laughs> you will not come out the same. Amen? It's like I was talking to Brother David last night and he was saying how Jacob wrestled with God. And Jacob was not the same afterwards. He walked out with a lump. <laughs> Yeah, you may walk in, but you'll lump out. <laughs> Amen? Because when God touches you, you will never rely on your own strength again. He had to walk on a stick for the rest of his life. <sighs> Amen? Sure. Okay, I'm, I'm having a moment here. Please, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. Verse 7. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? Listen. He said, I am he. Who are you see? Look at how Jesus is in control. I am me. Uh, who are you looking for? <laughs> I, I, I wish I was a, a fly on the wall to see their response. Can you imagine these men? I am coming to arrest this guy and he still has the audacity <laughs> to ask me who am I seeking. I said, it's you. <laughs> That's who I'm looking for. Please don't hit me again. <laughs> okay. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Look here. Jesus is no longer focused on him. He's focused on his disciples. He says, okay, I'm he. Just don't harm these that are with me. Look at the, 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 the selflessness. The, 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 he's, he's more worried about them than what he's about to go through. That is the control that Jesus has. Come on, if Jesus is in your life, he will fall asleep in the middle of your storm. You have to wake him. Do you not care? Like, hold on, just hold on, hold on. Sun and this and that, be still. Goes back to sleep. If we can have that confidence in knowing that he who is at rest can take a storm and bring the storm to its knees. Come on, that is the Jesus we serve. It's so exciting to be a Christian. I don't know why you want to worship Buddha. Rub his tummy, nothing's going to help. Rub his ear blow, but it's not going to help you. He can't do nothing for you. Okay? Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Verse 9. That, this, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Look at that. Jesus was fulfilling scripture. Every part of his life saying, these that are with me, I did not lose them. I protected them. Did you know when Jesus and the disciples, when the disciples were serving Jesus, did you know they did not carry money on them? They, they, they left their homes, their families. They were provided for. Everywhere they went, Jesus provided for them. When Jesus said, I'm about to leave, Then he tells his disciples, take a bag of money, take a jacket, take this, take that. He tells them to even arm themselves. But whilst they were with him, he met all their needs. Now you and I, we have Jesus in our hearts. He dwells on the inside. Can you imagine what he can accomplish through you and I? Amen. Okay, Luke 22 verse 49 to 53. Let's get through this. Are you all, yeah, you're still going home? Okay, we're there. All right. I'm still doing good for time. Okay. 
When those around him saw that he, what, he was go, what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Now, this is going a little bit back now. Check this out. Verse 50. And uh, one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Okay, 51. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. You need to understand that what Peter had done by cutting off his ear would have been punishment unto death. But Jesus repaired the ear so there was no evidence so that Peter could not lose his life. That is the sign of what Jesus has done for you and I, for our sin, that when we stand before a holy God, there is no evidence that we should be killed for our sin. Jesus covered his ear and re can you imagine your ears cut off? Hey, would lace the brood, but he cuts it off. And then Jesus puts the thing back on. You know, we play that game. I took your nose. That's a game. But yeah, this guy's ear was gone. And Jesus puts the ear back so that there is no evidence that you struck the high priest's servant. Because the punishment of that crime would be death. When Jesus touches the sin in your life, the evidence that should get you to the place of being punished and given eternity in hell, he cleanses as if there's no evidence because of his blood covers you. Ah, this is so good. Such good news. Gospel is good. Look here. Verse 51. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. 52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? 53. When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. You notice here, he's saying, this is your hour now. He's basically permitting this. He said, let this happen. I am permitting this. Now you and I, somebody accuses us, somebody says something, let's go to the parking lot, we'll see who's the best man standing. That is how we deal with things, where Jesus says, okay, I'm giving this to you. Not, the enemy did not know by him permitting himself to be surrendered and to go get crucified and to be beaten and accused. He was actually <laughs> setting us all up for our salvation. Come on, man. This is so good because Jesus is going through all of this on his own, but he is in control. He's got each and every one of us on his mind. Even those that are watching by live stream, he's thinking about you and I, that because I am surrendering my life, that they will have eternal life. Okay, John 18, verses 8 to 11. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus, 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? See, Jesus wanted it to be peaceful. He wanted to just let it go smoothly. He said, I am, boom, they fall under the power. So that they recognize this man, he's giving, he's just, he's just surrendering his life. He's, he's going willingly. He has the power to strike you down, but he's saying, I'm going willingly. He just gave himself over like that. Okay? Jesus healed the servant's ear so that there was no evidence of a crime punishable by death. That is power. So Jesus protected and paid for Peter. That is what he's done for us. He's already foreshadowing. He's covered us of all the crimes that we have done. The lying, the stealing, the cheating, the fornicating, the, all the things we've done. And he is saying, listen, they are innocent. He's taken it upon himself. Yes, Peter had foot and mouth disease. He's, he did things before thinking. <laughs> Jesus was saying, I need to, this is the cup. I, this is what I need to go through. This is what I have to go through. You don't need to go through this. I am willing to go through this for you. Now look here, Matthew 27 verse 50. I want to show you that even Jesus, you know, Pilate and the, 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 the soldiers could not kill him. They struck him. If you go read your Bible, it says the cat of nine tails. Most people died at that flogging. 
Because they beat you to pieces. Nothing was left. It was just bones and organs. Most people died at that. But here Jesus picked up his cross. He carried it after not having any sleep. Because he was going from Pilate to this one, to that one, being judged left, right, and said, not sleeping, getting punched up, getting his beard pulled down, being beaten, being spat on, all these things. And he's just going through the motions and he's chilling. Most of us, now I know our brother he just shared that he hasn't slept, okay? So you got some anointing on your life, but yeah, he's Jesus hasn't slept, he's been beaten, he's been accused, and not just that, the power of darkness is coming upon him. Our sin, our guilt, all of these things are coming upon him, and yet he's still standing. We can't handle it if somebody says something about us. But here is Jesus taking your and my sin, all of my sin. Past, present, and future sin. All the evil, the witchcraft that I was involved in, the witchcraft that many others practiced, all of that stuff came upon him. The curses came upon him. All of that of the world came upon him. But yet, he was still in control. Look here. He even, look here. Matthew 27 verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. You know what this word yielded means? It's speaking of sending forth, to send, to let alone, to let be, to let go. He would not have died unless, he said, he could have been up there still today. That's why he fulfilled scripture, because most people would take two to three days to pass away on that cross. They would break the legs so the people would suffocate. But when they came, they, this is what the Bible says, when they came to him, they were surprised that he had already passed away. Because they broke the legs of the others that were accused. So let's go to this. John chapter 10. We nearly finished. Verse 15 to 21. Because now we've seen Jesus gave up the ghost. But I want to share something just before him giving up the ghost. Because I want to show you that Jesus was still in control. Okay, verse, 10, uh, verse 15. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's you and I, okay? Verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. So he's talking about the Jews and he's talking about the Gentiles. He's going to lay down his life, okay? I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Every pastor, every apostle, every prophet, every evangelist, every teacher, every uh, elder, deacon, our job is to step out of the way so that Christ may be magnified, so that you connect directly to Jesus. You don't need to come to me to pray to God. I will help you how to pray directly to God. Okay? Look here. They will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one with one shepherd. Verse 17. Therefore my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. God is so in love with Jesus because Jesus is willing to lay down his life. Jesus is life. He is the source of life. Think about it. He cannot die. But he laid down that mantle. He laid down all he wa was and is. So that you and I who were dead can be translated into eternal life. Can you imagine the price? Think, well, I can't use the electricity here in South Africa because the power is on and off. But you go to a place where there's constant electricity, constant power. And for some reason, in order to reconnect a whole bunch of people that don't have power, you have to switch off for an hour or two to connect a new city or town so that they are connected to the source, to the grid. That is exactly what Jesus did. We were all dead. So he did a little bit of load shedding so that you and I can be connected. And now this power will never leave you. Amen? You will never have load shedding again. You might have a lot of power <laughs> for the ladies. Those sudden bursts of power. Yes, because you used to be a light, but now you're a heater. 
Because power cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transformed. That's what it is. So before you were a light, now you a heater in winter. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's got very quiet there. I thought the people would appreciate that one. But it's the truth. It's nice when you have your power, power surges because then you get it nice and warm. All right. Verse 18. So no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. He knows what he is capable of doing. Do you know what he's capable of doing? Because that is the game changer. When you know he is the resurrection. When you know he is the life. Verse 19. Therefore there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. Once again people will be. That's why today. Oh we don't believe in healing anymore. But Jesus still heals whether you believe it or not. Jesus still resurrects the dead whether you believe it or not. They will be divided because they don't understand. They read the same Bible but they are blinded because they've grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit. The reality is that Holy Spirit gives understanding. Last night we were talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Jesus said you're a bunch of demons. Your father is the devil. They studied the Torah. They studied the Bible. But they did not have God their father. So you can study the Bible. You can have as many degrees and how many certificates. My question to you is, who is your daddy? (sighs) Verse 20. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Verse 21. Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is why we pray for people. This is why we believe in the signs and the wonders and the miracles. We've seen it time and time and time again. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This is the last scripture and then we're going to pray. And and everybody said, Amen. Okay. John 11, 21 to 27. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, How many times have we said, Lord, if you were only in my job, only if you were in my marriage, did you give him room to be there? It's very quick that we turn the tables on Jesus, but did you give him permission to be in your home? Did you give him permission to be in your business? Did you give him permission to be in your your ministry? Jesus will not force himself in a place. You need to make room for him. But yeah, it's, it's always, if you had been here, Lord, if, if you were here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. See, when you pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. Because we know whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, according to the will of God's word, God's word is the will. You need to know God's word. You need to know God's word because then you'll know God's will. And when you know God's word and will, therefore in Jesus' name it shall come to pass. But if you've got doubt, if you're questioning, if you're not so certain in your heart, then there will be a delay. But when you become like Abraham who was fully persuaded, he knew that he knew that if I take my son and I sacrifice him, God will resurrect him or give me another. That is how sure Abraham was. You and I have these choices with our faith. Every day, it's choices. Do I believe or don't I believe? Do I believe a little or do I fully believe? Because there's always a little bit of a mixture. Sometimes there's a little bit of doubt. Ah, oh, God only comes through for the pastor because he's got an anointing, because he's got a big certificate. Certificate don't give you anointing. Certificate doesn't give you access. It's Jesus and knowing the word of God. I'm telling you, it's the only way. You try and do it in any other way, but let's continue. Verse 23, Jesus Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. This is after Jesus said, your brother, this man will not see death. Are you saying Jesus is a liar? Because that guy was dead. Okay. Jesus is showing you resurrection power. 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So they even know theology. There's coming a time that the dead will be raised. Okay? And we who are in Christ will be resurrected and raptured. Okay? Good news for Christians. And then when they come back for the Jews, we will be coming back. 
we, the Christians, will be seated on the 24 th uh, elders' throne in heaven. That's where we're going. Okay. Jesus, uh, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. Remember I said something last night? If you know God, you only die once. If you don't know Jesus, you die twice. That's why when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are born again. Okay? Look here. 26. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is very hard for people because we're thinking, you know, I just uh, buried Opa Hriki and uh, they died. And they used to go to church all the time. They were the ones that kept on beating me with the Bible. Just because you go to church does not mean you are right with the Lord. Because there's many wolves in sheep's clothing. There are many hypocrites. They claim to live a certain way. But when they leave here, they punch each other, beat each other, stab each other. Uh, but we leave that for counseling another time. But look here. 27. She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So tonight... There's four prayer points we're going to pray. First one, we're going to pray. If Jesus is in control of his destiny, when we make him Lord of our lives, he will be also in control of our destiny. See, many people know Jesus as Savior. He's always saving you out of a mess, always in rescue mode. But tonight, we need to get him to a place where he is our Lord. You see, when Jesus becomes your Lord, you will not backslide. See, men, okay, men understand this principle because their wives tell them what to do. No, it's the truth. No, 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 we understand this. Men understand authority. Single men, just, just wait on the Lord, okay? But we understand when something is instructed, we follow through. We know this. But this is what you need to come to a place. If Jesus Christ is your Lord, you will not backslide. You will have no room. For the enemy to come to steal, kill, and destroy. Because every choice, every decision you make, Jesus, what do you think? Should I go out with him or her? What do you say, Lord? God didn't answer me. That means it must be yes. Then you go and you go into the, no, no. Or you go into the garden and you find a daisy. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. Ah, Okay, next one. She loves me not, she loves me. Then you wonder why your daisies look the way they look. Because you love me, love me not. But when you get Jesus, he takes the daisy. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I grab the sand. Every grain of sand, he says, I love you. You cannot doubt the love. But tonight, we need to pray. Is Jesus Christ our Lord? And is he our Savior? Is he in control of our destiny? Are we trusting him with our tomorrow? Or are we trusting ourselves? Then the second prayer, tonight it is a, uh, it's a wonderful to receive Jesus as Savior. It's wonderful. But we must get out of being saved in rescue mode. Okay? From the power of the enemy and the power of sin, sickness, and disease. See, the enemy will come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus will save us. Okay? He will rescue us. But when he becomes Lord, then you speak of, over your circumstances and you declare the will and the word of God that I am blessed. I'm telling you, 15 years ago, I was on the streets. 15 years ago, living on the streets, moved into a garage. 15 years ago, this stuff works. Even when I was living in those conditions, I was still preaching the gospel. Nobody knew my living conditions. All they knew was what I was preaching, which was the word. I didn't come with faith with hints. So, oh, you know, life is tough. See, Jesus is in control. God is about to do something. He delivered me, and I have been free, and I remain free. You too can be free. But is he Lord? Is he master? Number three. Tonight, let's transition from Jesus being our Savior to Him becoming our Lord and Master. I know I'm repeating this because it needs to come to a place. Is He your Lord and Master? Or is He the one that you go to after you made your choices? Uh, I'm going to do what I want to do. Uh, uh, Lord, can you fix the situation here? You made your bed. 
and you heard a little voice say, don't do it. It's okay. I don't know. Turn up the music a little bit. Like, doof, doof, doof. There's this annoying sound that's telling me not to do this. Doof, doof, doof. Then the pastor says, my brother, my sister, oh, you must just shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You're just judging me. You don't know what you're talking about. You're so old-fashioned. Ah, da, 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 da. Put up the music. Doof, doof, doof. Ah. Where, did, where, where did I go wrong? Uh, where did you go wrong? <laughs> did you hear? God spoke. He gave you a dream. He gave you a vision. Because you didn't believe in the dreams and the visions. He spoke to you through people. Pastors. People. That, that, that auntie that you overlooked in church. She has been praying and interceding for you. And she warned you. First, last one. Tonight, we can ask Jesus to help us to restore all that that has been stolen from us tonight. Maybe yours, maybe joy, could be your marriage, could be your finances, could be your calling. Tonight is your night to make right with the Lord. Tonight, before we partake, because when we take communion, this is a covenant. This is like when a husband and wife come, stand before God, and they stand before a minister. They stand before the heavens and they stand before all the witnesses. And they were single. Now they're making a vow that I will love only you. My eyes are only on you. Let me look another way. Just now somebody thinks I'm looking. But I promise to love you till death do us part. And that's when she says, you look somewhere else and death will come soon. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I just saw the attitude there. Ladies, sass. Yo, take it easy. Take it easy. Okay, I'm on your side, but shame. Okay, but this is what's happening tonight. We are partaking of the bread, which, is, is, which represents Jesus' body. We are partaking of who he is. We are partaking of the Bible, because that's what it is. His body is the word. And you making a covenant today saying... All your promises are yes and amen, even though my life does not line up. But I believe your word, and I believe that your body was crushed and beaten for me so that I can be healed, I can be delivered, that I can prosper. But I'm making sure that I'm making a covenant with you tonight. I'm not making covenant with the devil. I'm not making a covenant with that denomination. I'm not making a covenant with that pastor. I'm making a covenant with you tonight, Lord. And maybe you here today and you're married and there's stuff that's not right. You say, Lord, I'm bringing this covenant. And I remember on that day, I made a vow between, before you and everybody else. And tonight I want your covenant to affect this covenant so that we get so close, Lord God, that we represent Jesus. People see through our marriage, Jesus. Not fake stuff on Facebook and you're looking at it and, and it looks like they are so happy, but yet they're boxing the whole time. I love you so much. And this hypocrisy, he's beating her, she's beating him, frying pan. Uh, and then you see Facebook have a, with some makeup covering up the blue eye, the black eye. It's fake. It's time now to bring everything to the light. Bring that union before God. Bring that relationship. Are you truly seeking God? Saying, Lord, is this what you want for my life? And sometimes it's hard because God's going to say, I've got better for you. But I want to do what I want to do. And God's going to permit it. He will never force you to do anything that you don't want to do. So tonight, I was going to ask you just to switch the lights off. Those that are watching by live stream, tonight we need to get serious. We need to check our hearts. Even those who have started businesses or started working in a new place. And have you truly asked God to help you? Have you truly dedicated that business to God? Have you truly brought it before Him? Because God will restore what the enemy has stolen. We've got testimonies of our pastors here. They're here tonight where they were working and uh, Pastor Marx was hijacked. And they tried to kill him. The gun went off. It was point blank range. It was what, two, three years ago? They're still here serving God. Others would have said, I'm done with this. It's too much. It's too hard. But I can tell you right now, if it wasn't for a praying wife 
and the prophetic that was flowing from this pulpit. We give God all the praise, all the honor and the glory. And God saved a family, saved a man. Amen. And if God can do it for one man or one family, one couple, I'm sure he'll do it for the rest of us. So tonight, Lord God, we come to you. We acknowledge our sin. We acknowledge our weaknesses. And Father, please forgive us. Forgive us for ignoring the warnings. Forgive us for not trusting you, for not believing you. Forgive us, Lord God, if we've put hope in temporal things, in temporal pleasures. But tonight, Lord God, we want to come back to you with all of our heart, with all of our strength, and all of our might. Tonight, Lord God, we return to you. Father, there are certain things that we struggle with. There are certain things that, that we're really battling with. And we're bringing it to you, Lord Jesus. You became that sin. You became that addiction. You became that struggle so that I can be set free. So tonight, Lord God, I want to make a covenant with you. And I want to make sure that I'm right with you tonight. I want you to not only be my savior, but I want you to be my Lord and my master. Lord, whatever you say, I trust you. Even if it's difficult, I will trust you. If you say go, I will go. If you say stop, I will stop. If you say turn left, I will turn left. If you say turn right, I will turn right. Lord, if you speak through people that have got a good track record, I will listen. I will not allow my offenses, my stubborn pride, to hinder you speaking to me through people who actually love and care. Tonight, Lord God, I'm coming back to the church. I'm no longer going to have excuses why I can't be there. I can be in the clubs and the pubs no matter what time or day. But for some reason, you can't make it to the house of God. So Father, tonight, please forgive us if we have chased entertainment rather than pursuing a relationship with you. Forgive us, Lord God, if we've been seeking for love in all the wrong places. So, Father, help us tonight. This we pray in Jesus' mighty name. I'm going to ask all the leaders now to get the emblems. And uh, if you've got your spouse here with you, if your spouse is not here, don't worry, you're one flesh. If you're trusting God for a breakthrough, whether it be in your marriage, finances, whatever it may be, tonight you're making a covenant with God. And we've seen that Jesus became poor in order for you and I to become wealthy. And wealthy is not just talking about finances. It's included. But to be healthy in our minds, healthy in our bodies, in spirit, soul, and body. Completely made whole and we are making a covenant with the living god this is not a contract that you are signing you are not signing a document which has got terms and conditions that you can break it but this is a covenant that you are saying that i want to become one with jesus i want to become one with the holy spirit and i want to become one with the father and i want to partake of his body and all his promises that's through the bible Everything that he went through, I want to partake of his body. Okay, so we're going to do this on our own time. I'm just giving you like the rundown. And then once you've partaken of the bread, then you look at the juice. The juice represents his blood. This is a covenant that is sealed with the life of Jesus, an eternal blessing. Thank you. And he is saying that I am the source of life. And that life is speaking on your behalf that speaks a better word that's saying you are blessed you are chosen you are anointed you are called amen so we're gonna we're gonna take our time in this and we're gonna do this as individuals and as the lord leads thank you so much my sister but as you do this i want you to be serious tonight check your heart check your motives amen because you don't just rush in and make a covenant. 
But if you know who you're making a covenant with, and you know the benefits which are eternal, amen? You're making it with the right being. He's a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. Amen? Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we can come into covenant with you. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are dealing with our hearts right now. That you are searching our hearts and our minds. And therefore, as we come to you, Lord God, that we do not partake of this unworthily. We come, Father God, with a humble heart. We come to you in need of your help that we have made a choice and a decision to make you Lord and Master over our lives. Thank you for rescuing us from eternal death. Thank you for paying the price for our sicknesses and our disease and our poverty. Thank you, Lord God. And as we partake of your body, Lord God, we thank you. We partake of your glorified body, your healing and your deliverance. And we sustain it by your word. In Jesus' mighty name. So we thank you, Father God, for your blood. The life is in the blood. Eternal life, abundant life. And your blood was shed for each and every one of us. Your blood was placed on the mercy seat. They cries out, have mercy upon them. Have mercy upon them. As we obtain grace and mercy, we thank you. It is sealed and purchased in full by the blood of Christ. We appropriate the power in the blood of Christ. We can protect now. And remember what you've done for us. Remember the price that you paid for us. Thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed, that every day we can walk in your precious blood of Jesus, that it is protecting us, our families, and our homes. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for us, that all the sicknesses that were paid for on the cross, Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you for your sacrifice. We don't remember it only once a year, but remember it every single day of the price that you paid for us. And let us never take for granted what you did on the cross for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. We can have the lights on. Please, can we have our cups back? Thank you. <laughs> our leaders are coming around with the cups. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's been a blessed evening. Thank you, Lord Jesus, to be in the house of God. Um, I just want to offer a quick offering, tithes and offerings. Uh, give everyone an opportunity, should you wish to sow or give an offering during the season of Passover. Um, Pastor Nelson has a card machine. He's going to be on this side. Um, I think it's such an, a privilege to be able to give in this time of Passover remembering what the Lord has done for us. I mean, how many of you have got testimonies of God coming through financially for you? I'm sure every one of us has got a testimony. And it's because he always remembers the times we've given, the times we've been faithful. You know, the Bible says he remembers our seed, even generations to come. Can you imagine your great-great-grandchildren one day could be living in the middle of New York and they get blessed because of your offerings, your tithe, and your seed, because God remembers your offerings and your seeds. Amen. That is a blessing. So I'm just going to pray with you, then you can come forward. Uh, Pastor Rosie's got envelopes. Pastor, oh, Teacher Chantal's got an envelope. Thank, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> teacher Liesel. What did I say? You guys know what I mean. Praise God. We're all one spirit, one flesh. Amen. <laughs> the leaders are so close that they even swap names. Praise God. <laughs> so Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. It's a privilege to come and give during the season of Passover. And as we give this evening, Lord, we just want to say thank you for every time that you came through for us. And those who are still trusting God for a breakthrough, we thank you, Lord. It's coming soon in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. You're welcome to come and give. Praise God. Um, tomorrow, 9 a.m. is our last Resurrection Sunday. I mean, if you're not in church tomorrow, that's bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm joking. I saw a thing on Facebook that says, if Jesus can be raised from the grave, you can come to church on Sunday. Okay, <laughs> so... <laughs> So thank you, Jesus. So we'll be here nice and early tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., to celebrate our risen Savior. We're playing all those nice songs of, He's out of the grave. He's alive. Praise. Woohoo. So praise God, because He's still alive today. Amen. So that's tomorrow night, uh, there, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. 
the wrong tube. Um, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, no evening service, so please stay home. If you're going to be here, we're not going to be here. So if you want a revival service in the parking lot, that's up to you, brother. Okay, so no evening service tomorrow. Um, Wednesday, are, are we back in our home groups? Except for the Benoni guys, because we'll, we'll, we'll put on your groups. We'll put on your groups. Okay, if you're in a group, we'll put you on a group. Okay, we'll keep you all updated. We're one month away from our launch in Benoni. So we're very, very excited. I forgot the, the, the flyers at home. Please forgive me, but they will. You were supposed to remind me. Anyway, <laughs> they will be here tomorrow morning. If not, can someone just remind me? Anyone, send me a message tomorrow morning. Pass that if you've got the, the, the flyers. Okay. So you can start handing them out already at your place. If you know people that are in Benoni that are not in a church, or maybe they need a breakthrough and they just want to start growing, please invite them to come and join us in the Benoni campus. And once again, I'm going to repeat, we are not leaving you. We're still going to be here. You will see us every Friday, every Sunday, we will be here. Amen. Service times are different, so we shall be here. Just so no one's like, that pastors are leaving us. No, we're not. Okay. Praise God. So we're still going to be here. When we have a Passover conference, they're going to have a Passover conference. They're going to interlap, but it's going to be awesome. Praise God. So we're very excited. Um, next week, uh, Sunday, we're going to be, uh, Saturday, we'll be meeting if you can join us to make some noise in the Bunny Park area, please join us so we can just reach the area, make some noise, let them know St. Ones is coming. Amen. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you all for being here this evening. I'm going to pray with you, and I'm going to let you go. So, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this Saturday evening in your house, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the families that couldn't be here this evening, those that are overcoming, those who are on holiday. We just plead the blood of Jesus over them. We thank them. Thank you, Lord, for them, and that we'll be back tomorrow morning to celebrate your resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed Saturday, and we'll see you tomorrow.